is the first of two videos on infrared or IR spectroscopy. This one is a little bit more focused on the theory behind it, and then the next one is going to be some practical, practical examples of analyzing IR spectra. Many types of spectroscopy involve the interaction between light or electromagnetic radiation and matter. Um, two important properties of light uh, are the wavelength and the frequency. And it's important to remember that the wavelength is inversely proportional to the energy and that the frequency is directly proportional to the energy. This is just a quick review of the electromagnetic spectrum. Remember, there are many different types of electromagnetic radiation and they differ in their frequencies and their wavelengths. So down here on the long wavelength, and so this is the low energy and low frequency region, we've got our microwaves and radio waves. We then have infrared, visible. Ultraviolet is higher in energy and higher in frequency than visible light. And then the highest energy and highest frequency electromagnetic radiation with the shortest wavelengths are our gamma rays and our x-rays. Now the different regions of the electromagnetic spectrum are used to probe different aspects of molecular structure. In nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, or NMR, we use radio waves to look at the specific arrangement of carbon and hydrogen atoms in the compound. Uh, in this chapter, we're talking about IR spectroscopy, uh, where we use infrared radiation, uh, and with this we can identify different functional groups present in the compound. And in general chemistry, uh, you've almost certainly used ultraviolet slash visible spectroscopy, and uh, UV spectroscopy is looking at um, electronic transitions in the molecule. I think it's important to note that the different types of electromagnetic radiation interact with matter in fundamentally different ways. Uh, and so radio waves uh, interact with the nuclear spin. That's why they're used in uh, NMR spectroscopy. Microwaves and radio waves uh, also cause the molecules to rotate faster when they absorb that type of electromagnetic radiation. In infrared spectroscopy, uh, when we use uh, infrared ra radiation, we actually cause the molecules to vibrate faster. Uh, in visible and ultraviolet spectroscopy, we're causing electrons to move into different orbitals. And then in higher energy ultraviolet and X-rays and gamma rays, we can actually cause atoms and molecules to be ionized, so we're ripping off electrons, or we can even break chemical bonds. So on the previous slide, we mentioned that uh, infrared radiation interacts with molecules via their vibrations. And so the number of different ways that molecules can vibrate. We can have stretching vibrations, we can have bending vibrations, and then we can have sort of out of plane twisting. Uh, in this chapter, we're going to focus mainly on stretching frequencies uh, because I think they're the most useful in identifying functional groups in compounds, which is one of the primary things that we use iris spectroscopy for. So one of the things that makes iris spectroscopy work is that not all bonds are excited by the same amounts of energy. For example, a CH bond requires significantly more energy to be excited than a CO bond. And so, in order to cause an excitation in a CH vibration, I have to use significantly higher, elect, en higher energy electromagnetic radiation, and less energetic electromagnetic radiation is required to excite a carbon-oxygen bond. And carbon-oxygen bonds in different molecules tend to have similar energy gaps. And so, a CO bond in two different molecules is going to be excited by similar wavelengths or frequencies of electromagnetic radiation. So this is a fairly simple schematic of how an infrared spect spectrometer would work. Basically we have a light source that's emitting infrared radiation. We have a monochromator that selects a specific wavelength. Uh, then we shine that wavelength through the sample and we know the intensity or the brightness of the light before it went into the sample, and then we can measure the intensity or the brightness of light after it comes out of the sample. And so if the intensity was decreased for this particular wavelength of radiation that we're using, then we know that the sample absorbed that radiation. 
And we said before that the different types of bonds will absorb different wavelengths of radiation. So then what we do is we scan through and, and shine a whole bunch of different types uh, or different wavelengths or frequencies of radiation and see at what frequencies is the sample absorbing infrared radiation. And then we can use that information to uh, identify the functional groups in our compound. So this is a picture of what a typical infrared spectrum might look like. And so very often we report the percent or we plot the percent transmittance, right? And so uh, at 100% transmittance, that means that the sample is not absorbing any of that particular frequency of electromagnetic radiation at all. When we have these low percent transmittances, that means that the sample is absorbing the light at these frequencies. Now, if you look at the bottom of this spectrum, you'll see that the units on the y-axis are in something called wave numbers. Uh, the wave number is the most common unit used to report uh, infrared uh, frequencies, and the wave number is related to the frequency. It's the frequency uh, in hertz divided by the speed of light in meters per second. Uh, and then uh, to distinguish it from the frequency being reported in hertz or inverse seconds, we put the tilde on top. Uh, and the units that we use for wave numbers are one over centimeters or centimeters to the minus one. Or sometimes you'll hear these called inverse centimeters. And so we have our lowest frequency here on the right at 400 wave numbers and the highest frequency in this plot up here around 4,000 wave numbers. And these are pretty typical um, ranges that will look at the IR spectrum. So there are three important characteristics of the IR spectrum that we're looking at when we're analyzing it. The first thing that we're looking at is, right, what is the frequency or what is the wave number of the absorption? Uh, and so that's essentially just where does the peak fall on the x-axis? So, right, this uh, absorption is occurring at around uh, 3,400 or 3,300 wave numbers. The other thing that we're looking at is the intensity, right? And so that's uh, how high the percent transmittance is, right? So I would say that these two peaks have relatively um, large intensities, right? We're absorbing a lot of that particular uh, frequency of electromagnetic radiation, right, where this peak has a relatively low intensity. And the other thing that we're looking at is the shape. And so, you know, this is a fairly broad fat peak, right, whereas some of these are very narrow peaks. And these different aspects, the wave number or the frequency, the intensity, and the shape uh, all tell us things about our compound. So the first of these characteristics that we're going to talk about is the wave number, or at what frequency um, our compound is going to be absorbing uh, the infrared radiation. And so remember that uh, for these vibrations, right, we're, th we're thinking of our molecule as vibrating, and we can sort of think about our atoms uh, that are involved in the vibration as being connected by a spring. And so there are a couple of things that goes into determining uh, the frequencies at which the molecules vibrate, and then therefore the frequencies of electromagnetic radiation that they're going to absorb. Uh, one of them is the force constant. That's essentially the strength of the bond. So the higher the force constant, the stronger the bond, and the higher the stretching frequency is going to be. And then in the denominator here, we have the reduced mass. And the way the reduced mass works is basically the heavier the atoms are that are involved in the vibration, the lower the frequency is going to be. So we can see the two things we talked about on the last slide when we compare these different uh, frequencies uh, that would be absorbed by these different stretches, right? So uh, the first trend corresponds to the reduced mass. So we have the different frequencies between carbon and these other elements, right? So when we go from hydrogen to, right, this is deuterium. This is a, a hydrogen with two neutrons in its uh, nucleus. Um, and then when we go to oxygen and chlorine, we can see right, as the mass of that thing that's paired with the carbon increases, the vibrational frequency goes down. And then this trend is related to the force constant. And so single bonds are weaker than double bonds, which are weaker than triple bonds. So triple bonds are the strongest. And so we can see right when we go from the weaker single bond 
to the stronger double bond to the even stronger triple bond, the, f the vibrational frequencies increase. So this slide is going to be particularly relevant when we get to analyzing the IR spectrum. We often divide the spectrum into two different regions. And so we divide it into the region above 1500 wave numbers and the region below 1500 wave numbers. The fingerprint region can be very hard to analyze. It's often very complicated. There are often a lot of peaks in this region. And so oftentimes uh, we'll kind of ignore that. And we'll spend most of our time focusing on the diagnostic region, which is above 1500 wave numbers. So what we're seeing in this slide is the IR spectra for 2-butanol and 2-propanol. And we can see in the region above 1500 wave numbers, the absorption spectra are very similar. Right? And this is in part what makes IR spectroscopy so useful. Uh, when we have similar functional groups, they're going to absorb si similar frequencies of radiation. Now the drawback can be uh, that when we have similar molecules like this, it might be difficult to distinguish them using IR spectroscopy. This might be uh, an instance where we have to look at the fingerprint region um, or go to a different analysis technique. Another thing that can help us to uh, analyze our IR spectrum is that the CH stretches tend to occur uh, around 3,000 wave numbers. Um, but there's a difference between uh, the stretches when the CH stretch involves an sp3 hybridized carbon versus an sp2 or an sp hybridized carbon. And so you can see the frequencies of the sp3 sp hybridized carbon tend to be below 3000 wave numbers and the sp2 is a little bit above and the sp is a little bit higher than that. So when we're analyzing the spectrum, in addition to drawing a line at 1500 wave numbers to separate the diagnostic region from the fingerprint region, what we'll also often do is draw a line at about 3000 wave numbers. And when we see peaks just below that, we know that these are uh, CH stretches due to sp3 hybridized carbons. And then uh, the presence of an alkene with an allylic hydrogen um, are a little bit higher, around 3100 wave numbers. And then uh, having a hydrogen uh, attached to an SP hybridized carbon is going to be even higher still. Another thing that can affect the frequencies that the molecules absorb the infrared radiation is resonance. So if I'm comparing these two compounds, they actually have, uh, when I look at the CO stretch, they actually have slightly different vibrational frequencies. And we can see why on the next slide. So in our first ketone that had the higher vibrational frequency, it has just two resonance structures, right? So this is the dominant resonance structure, but then we mix in uh, a little bit of this resonance structure where we have more single bond character. In this conjugated ketone that has the lower vibrational frequency, we have an additional resonance structure, right? So the resonance hybrid is going to have a little bit more single bond character between the carbon and the oxygen. And so that's what results in the shift to the slightly lower frequency, right? Remember, double bonds tend to have higher frequencies than single bonds. So the more single bond character I have in my resonance hybrid, the lower the frequency is going to be. Okay, so we've just been looking at some of the factors that influence the frequencies uh, that the compound is going to absorb. Uh, we next want to think about the intensities, right? And so intensity tells us how much of, the, of that particular frequency of electromagnetic radiation the compound is absorbing. And so when we have a strong signal with a low percent transmittance, right, we have a big peak, we would call that a strong signal. When the molecule is not absorbing very much, we would call that a weak signal. So in this example, we're comparing the intensity of a carbon-oxygen double bond stretch versus a carbon-carbon double bond stretch. You can see that the carbon-oxygen stretch has a significantly higher intensity than the carbon-carbon stretch. So it turns out that in order to absorb infrared radiation, the dipole moment of the molecule must change as a result of that particular vibration. And so in general, the greater the polarity of the bond that's involved in that particular stretch, the higher the intensity is going to be, right? And so because a carbon-carbon bond, right, is not very uh, polar at all because the carbons have the same electronegativity, it tends to have a lower intensity, whereas the carbon-oxygen bond is very polar, and so it tends to have a much higher intensity.
one of the results of the requirement that the dipole moment of the molecule must change as a result of that vibration, some vibrations are not IR active. Um, they can't, those vibrations cannot be excited by absorbing infrared radiation. Uh, and so one example of that is this molecule here. You know, because we have a carbon-carbon double bond, we might expect there to be a peak in this region, um, but because uh, that stretch is perfectly symmetrical, the dipole moment of the molecule won't change, and that uh, stretch is invisible to uh, infrared radiation. Uh, this is also why things like oxygen in the atmosphere and nitrogen in the atmosphere are not IR active, they're not greenhouse gases, because when this oxygen and this nitrogen vibrate, the dipole moment of the molecule doesn't change, where something like carbon dioxide, when we have bending motions or when we have asymmetric stretches where one oxygen goes in and the other and the other oxygen goes out, that does change the dipole moment of the molecule. And so carbon dioxide is IR active, and that's why it contributes to the greenhouse effect. Now, another factor that plays into the intensity of some of these peaks is that we'll have stronger signals or stronger intensities when there are multiple of the same types of those bonds vibrating. So although carbon-hydrogen bonds are not very polar, because we often have a lot of them, they may give high intensities in our IR spectrum. The final characteristics of our peaks that we want to talk about is the shape. And so generally what we're looking at is do we have a broad signal or a narrow signal? And what are the factors that contribute uh, to these different types of signals? So it turns out that OH bonds often have very broad peaks, and that's a result of hydrogen bonding. Because hydrogen bonds are transient, right, you know, they're, they're not as strong as, certainly as covalent bonds, right, one molecule might be participating in hydrogen bonding at the time that we uh, take the spectra, and other molecules in the sample might not be. And so uh, when we have hydrogen bonding, it weakens the OH covalent bond causing it to uh, absorb lower frequencies of radiation and because we have may have more or less uh, amounts of hydrogen bond going on at a given time in the sample that tends to spread the peak out. We have some molecules that are participating in hydrogen bonding they're going to absorb at lower frequencies some molecules that are not participating in hydrogen bonding they're going to be absorbing at somewhat higher frequencies and so this gives rise to the broad peaks. So I think in most of the spectra that we're going to look at, uh, there's going to be hydrogen bonding going on. But we can see the difference, right? When I have a free OH, right, it's a very narrow signal, and it's at relatively higher frequencies, right? And when we have OH bonding going on, right, it spreads it out um, and shifts it to lower frequencies. And so this type of signal, we sort of have the smooth, broad, high-intensity peak, is very characteristic of OH bonds when it's at about you know 3,400 or 3,500 wave numbers. So another functional group that's really easy to spot are carboxylic acids. And so they participate in hydrogen bonding extensively, and so they tend to have super broad peaks that are centered around 3,000 wave numbers. Uh, and so whenever we have these really, really broad peaks, that's characteristic of an OH stretch from a carboxylic acid. And we can also identify uh, the carboxylic acids because they're also going to have a peak due to the carbon-oxygen double bond um, in the double bond region of the diagnostic region of the spectrum. Okay, the final type of functional group that I want to talk about uh, in this video is amines. And so amines typically absorb around uh, 3,400 wave numbers, um, and we can distinguish between a primary amine that has two hydrogens and a secondary amine that just has one hydrogen based on the shapes of their peaks. Uh, so it turns out for the primary amine, when we have these two hydrogens, there are two types of stretching that can occur. We can have symmetric stretching, where the hydrogens are sort of going away and together at the same time, or we can have asymmetric stretching, where one's going in and the other one's going out, and vice versa. Uh, and so because the primary amines have two types of nitrogen-hydrogen vibrations, they get two peaks close together because we only have one type of stretching available in the secondary amine, we have just the one peak.
So I know that we covered a lot of information in this video. Um, if you go on and watch the second video, we're going to look at some practical examples and how we can apply a lot of things that we've talked about in this video to analyzing a spectra and distinguishing between spectra of different compounds.